Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dakari's 27th virtual fire investigative training session. Uh, tonight, we have ATF electrical engineer Mike Abraham. And Mike is going to talk to us tonight about lithium ion battery fires. So, Mike, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Bill. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. And um, I've been given this presentation around the country because, as we all know, Lithium battery related fires have been growing and have become, you know, very relevant in the news. Um, so we'll hit on some of the most common incidents that we've come across, as well as, you know, some general things to look for as a fire investigator when you're approaching a lithium ion battery based fire. When we talk about lithium ion batteries, uh, you know, we take for granted how ubiquitous they actually are. Um, everybody here has a lithium ion battery within line of sight. Your cell phones utilize them. If you're joining us from a laptop computer or from an iPad or other um, tablet type device, they likely have a lithium ion battery in them. Uh, if you're wearing wireless headphones like I am right now, they have a rechargeable lithium ion battery in them. Your digital cameras, your two-way radio, if you happen to be on duty. Um, the most recent lithium battery related fire that I was consulted about was actually yesterday into today morning and it involved a Motorola radio on the bridge of a vessel located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana that the Coast Guard asked us to help evaluate. Um, rechargeable appliances, you know, think about your wireless uh, vacuum cleaners, uh, electric razors, toothbrushes, of course, electric vehicles, whether it's a Tesla, Rivian, any of those types of brands, we'll hit on those a little bit. And then some other things like medical devices that you may come across. When we talk about a lithium ion battery, you know, they share a lot of common uh, design aspects with other batteries, but they have a few unique characteristics. You know, a lot of time we're talking about a, a positive end and a negative end. Uh, there's a separator that, that, that separates those two items. And then there's an electrolyte, which allows for the lithium uh, transfer between them when it's charging or discharging. There's also uh, integrated protection means to prevent these types of batteries from going into thermal runaway or having issues. But as we know from you know, experience, they don't always get a chance to work properly. Uh, some of those things can include mechanical charge interrupt devices, such as a CID, um, PTC type devices, which are temperature based, um, and as well as electronic protection, which can be integrated into a cell or as a part of a larger battery management system for a pack. Here's a diagram that shows the general operation of a lithium ion battery when it's in the charging and discharging state. And it shows the, uh, the various components that we talked about as far as anode, cathode, separator, and the flow of uh, the ions via the electrolyte um, during either state of, of charge or discharge. When we talk about lithium batteries, there are, there are a variety of different geometries. Uh, one of the most common types that you'll come across are cylindrical lithium ion batteries. Um, you can see in that image on the top left, we have the cathode anode separators, the PTC, um, the canister itself, the top end cap, including the, 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 the protection devices. Top right, uh, we have a pack consisting of several individual cells. So when we talk about a lithium ion battery, in some instances, it could be an individual cell being utilized as the battery itself, or the cell can be a part of a larger battery pack uh, put together to reach required design voltage and current requirements. On the bottom there, we have an, you know, a pouch type battery. Uh, there's a variety of different um, geometries and chemistries. And a lot of times in your cell phone, for example, you'll come across a pouch type battery in order to benefit from the energy density and storage capacity, but also the small form factor. And this uh, blown up diagrams over here, blown up parts diagrams right over here, just show you, uh, you know, a Galaxy S20 from Samsung, as well as a, an iPhone uh, 12 Pro. And you can see that there is a battery as a part of that array on the top and the bottom there. So, you know, it's not going to be surprising that a battery can be involved in a fire if you come across somebody either having have left a cell phone in a location, whether it be a vehicle and a structure on their person. And there's also the possibility we have to consider that the battery itself on the cell phone has an issue. Um, one of my most recent experiences actually involved a, a cross country flight. I was flying into San Francisco and I'm sitting in on the plane on the left side, left hand side and I smell the characteristic odor of what smelled like to me a battery failing. I look over to my right and I see a white wispy smoke and it happened to be a passenger that dropped his iPhone into the motorized seat. And they tell you on the flights, don't move your seat because you can potentially create a situation. And that's what he did. He tried to get his phone back. He moved the seat, it crushed the iPhone and then 
cause the battery to go in thermal runaway, and we'll talk about why that may happen. Here's some laptop lithium ion batteries. Uh, you can see in the top right and top left, they have cylindrical type cells. Uh, they're located inside the actual removable battery packs, but you may also have a configuration where it's a non-serviceable or non-user end user removable battery pack, and it may have a LiPo like we talked about where it's a thin pouch type battery. There on the bottom right, you can see another type of battery which has smaller uh, pouch type cells within it. Here's an example of different size cylindrical cells in a comparison to what you know a conventional AAA or AA would be. Uh, one of the most common cell sizes that you'll come across, whether it's in tool battery packs or even they used to be in Teslas are the 18650. Um, more recently, they've transitioned to the 2170 and then and as of recently, they're switching over to the 4680. So those numbers there that you're looking at refer to the, uh, the physical dimensions of the cell. So an 18650 is actually 18 millimeters in diameter and 65 millimeters in length. We talk about battery management system. These play a big role in trying to prevent lithium batteries from ultimately going into thermal runaway and having issues. Uh, they manage things like cell voltage. They make sure that charging is balanced across the cells. They can monitor temperature depending on their configuration to see uh, whether or not a cell is having an issue and isolate them from the pack. Um, they can be integrated into a cell like you see on the bottom there, a picture of an 18650 with the internal circuit protection located within it. Um, and more common though, is gonna be like on the top left and top right where you have an external battery management system utilizing individual cells as a part of the battery assembly. So this is one of the major issues that can occur when you think about manufacturing. So let's say you have a reputable manufacturer that has developed a product such as a hoverboard, which is intended to use X number of 18650s within it to provide a certain amount of voltage and current for their product. They integrated an external battery management system that monitors those cells and everything works. Every time you charge it and discharge it and use it, it's monitoring. And if something were to happen, it prevents you from actually charging the batteries on the actual device. If I'm an after party, aftermarket or third party manufacturer and I wanna make a cost cutting cheaper product to sell on the, uh, the market, one of my options is to perhaps use a less expensive battery. Maybe I don't use a battery that has integrated protection and that's right, right away cheaper because I don't have to include the electronics into that and I go ahead and use that in my product. Another way to be cheap about it is to eliminate the electronics associated with the battery management system. A lot of times when you don't have a battery management system, the assumption is that you're using cells that are inherently internally protected. And the combination of the two where you don't have internal protection or an external battery management system can lead to use which breaks down the batteries and it goes unmonitored and can result in a failure and fire causation ultimately. So that's a common situation you come across with a lot of these unlisted um, cheaper products where they have to do something to co cut costs while maintaining the same form factor and performance. And a lot of times it's electronics which uh, help prevent these types of batteries from causing fires. Some of the causes for thermal runaway in a battery, um, external heating, right? So if it's a battery that's being stored in a, in a normally hot, or even environmentally in a too cold environment when it's charging, it can lead to issues. Um, external heating can also, of course, include another type of uh, a thermal property, which is just exposure to fire. So understand that uh, lithium batteries, while they can break down and go into thermal runaway and cause a fire, they can oftentimes result in a failure from being impinged upon by fire. So a lot of the effort that we're putting into figuring out what batteries look like pre and post fire has to do with, can we try and tell the difference between a battery that's impinged upon by fire versus a battery that's failed and caused a fire? Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but the short answer to that is it's very difficult. And it's almost like an arc bead that you find during your scene examination, right? If you find arc melting alone, or if you find a damaged battery alone, it doesn't necessarily mean anything without context around it. So you can't necessarily look at a battery that has its contents ejected or it's split down the middle or the cap is missing and say, this battery failed and caused a fire. You'd have to overlay that with the other information that's being developed as a part of your investigation, whether it's you know witness interviews, other electronic data, fire patterns, fire dynamics, and see how that converges to a hypothesis that makes sense and whether or not that lithium battery being involved with the fire as a cause or being a victim of the fire makes more sense. Uh, overcharging, that's a situation that can occur when you use third-party chargers with a battery that you've obtained from whatever manufacturer it may be. Um, it could be just because you have a variety of batteries and you mismatch charging. Uh, batteries when they're designed are designed to be charged at a particular charge rate and 
they are designed to be able to dissipate heat according to that amount. And if you start to charge the battery at a higher voltage, a higher current in a lower amount of time, you may be impacting the original design and then you can create issues with the battery that can ultimately manifest themselves as a fa failure. When we're talking about over discharging, let's say you take a battery and you put it into a third party device that wasn't necessarily meant for that battery to utilize it in. Uh, a lot of people repurpose cells that they find out of products and make their own homemade energy storage systems for use with solar, solar systems. Um, I'll show you a picture coming up for a Tesla where uh, the photos actually were sourced from somebody that bought a gray market Tesla battery pack in order to make a Tesla, a homemade energy storage system, aka like a Tesla wall. Um, in those situations, if you start using those batteries without the types of electronics that are limiting the amount of discharge of current, you create a situation where you can create excess heat. And now we're getting back to the fact that creating a lot of heat can cause issues. The heating and, and things like high current charging where you're mismatching the chargers and charging in cold weather all can result in plating of lithium, which is dent, can result in dendrite formation. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Structural damage can also result in a failure. This can be external, just based on accidentally dropping it and, and stepping on it. It could be just physical damage as a result of a num number of incidents. Um, and then of course, external short circuiting. When you externally short circuit one of these batteries, it's like anything else. If you have a suitable fuel that can't handle the amount of current being delivered, you can cause ignition externally, but at the same time, you're causing a rapid discharge of current from the battery. All of these scenarios compromise the anode, cathode, or the positive and negative layers and the separator. And eventually you can get the separator compromised, whether it be by physical damage, excess heating, internal arcing, and you generate enough heat. Um, those cylindrical type batteries and type pouch type batteries that we referred to before all have electrolyte within them. And the most chemistries these days are utilizing a hydrocarbon based electrolyte. So this is in the liquid format within the cell. And as you start to heat it from any of these types of uh, external abuse conditions, as it lists there, the result can be that you, you transition from liquid to vapor, and now you have this combustible vapor, and the battery should vent. But the problem is, if you're generating heat faster than the vapor can be vented, and you arc within it internally, you can create an ignition source for the actual flammable gases that are generated as they vent. And that's why we see a lot of times catastrophic failures where you get the gases venting simultaneously with flames and explosions, and that's a battery going into thermal runaway. Once that happens, it can't be stopped. So the next steps are going to be preventing propagation to adjacent cells. So a lot of technology these days is being put into how can we prevent the propagation? Because once the electrolyte is involved and the battery's energy is being discharged as rapidly as it can in a short circuit internally from any of these means of, uh, of damage, you can't stop that from an individual cell. So that's the issue that occurs with a lot of these. Uh, then, of course, there's there's another form of, of damage which can result from manufacturing defects like I have listed here. So the manufacturing defects could be anything from, you know, a speck of dust or a contaminant that's within the actual battery itself, which causes a partial perforation or tear between the separator on that separator and between the, the layers. And eventually you can arc track between. And of course, we know during that process, you generate heat. So as you're generating heat, we go back to any of the other failure modes as they generate heat, it breaks it down further, and then you can get the, the thermal runaway and ultimate failure. The dendrite formation is what happens when that lithium plating occurs, and that actually can almost generate what looks like stalactites and caves and, and such, and penetrate the separator, resulting in thermal runaway. So these are all failure modes that can occur from the various types of uh, issues that we described before, and we'll go over some of them and see what the ultimate result was on some of the batteries that we come across. Ultimately, you know, you're going to come across these batteries in, in a fire um, and you're going to be asking yourself, what can I look for right off the bat to help determine what's going on here? Uh, one of the big things is right away the accountability for how many cells are supposed to be in the, the pack itself. Like I mentioned, you can have, let's say, a flashlight, which utilizes one 18650. But uh, I'll give you the example from uh, this morning was the Motorola radio battery that was involved with this fire on the ship. Uh, we found two. 18650s that were ejected with their contents and located remote from that that failure of the item. And the question was, how many cells is this lithium ion quote unquote battery that's on the Motorola device supposed to have? So an x-ray was shot 
of an intact one, and we were able to confirm that there's supposed to be two there. So now we have the two cells. You may come across a situation where a cell has five or 10 to achieve whatever voltage it is, like an 18 volt battery, and you may be missing one or two, and I'll show some pictures of that. And the question becomes, you know, what happened to this battery pack where the one or two cells ejected themselves versus the other stationary ones? You know, when you think about fire impingement upon a battery pack with 10 cells, you, you imagine, you know, just like we're talking about a damage dynamics analysis, all of those cells are being uniformly heated. Now you may have directional heating from one side or the other, from top to bottom, but ultimately it's gonna be washed over by a wave of fire. So the question becomes, why did one have sufficient exposure long enough to ultimately fail while the other, while the other ones remained stationary and didn't act like a rocket motor and eject? Um, a lot of times the failure can be for the adjacent cell next to the one that actually initially had an issue because it gets preheated. So we're looking for basically that differential damage. You know, where you're looking for stationary cells versus ejected cells. You're looking for bulged contents, ejected contents versus cells that are intact with all their contents there. And you start to ask yourself, why am I finding cells with different states of damage? Of course, you have to take into consideration other factors from your fire, you know, such as once the cell, the battery was involved, was it protected in one way versus another battery pack from a different item in a different way? You know, you're always trying to do that apples to apples comparison. Uh, internal mass loss or arc perforations. A lot of times this information is not going to be able to be obtained by just a, a visual examination on scene. And the reason for that is just like everything else we do in the electromechanical realm and fire investigation, we try to be as non-destructive as possible. So you're going to have to do either x-ray imaging or CT imaging in order to try and see whether or not one cell has more internal mass loss or less internal mass loss than an adjacent cell, if there are any arc perforations located within the layers, et cetera. And we'll have some images of those. You know, you're gonna be recovering cells from your scene processing. Uh, just remember this photo later on when I talk about a case study, because this is actually related to that. And these are just four cells in various states of damage. You can see that the center one has some physical damage. You can see that there's, <laughs> excuse me, some partial uh, contents ejected. And of course it's on a rainy scene, right? Cause we never get scenes that are when it's 70 and sunny outside. You look at like uh, an image like this where there's an 18650 and you ask yourself, where is this located? This actually came from a situation where a woman was carrying this 18650 as a spare battery in her purse for a vape. It externally shorted and ejected from the purse and got lodged into a ceiling tile. So we're not necessarily just looking for the ejected cells in the immediate area of origin, but we also have to consider remote possibilities that uh, the cells can be ejected. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Here's a video of an interesting event. So you can see once that uh, battery went into thermal runaway, we had a uh, rapid development. Uh, we had a lot of ejection of gases, flammable gases, and it was a pretty quick event. So a lot of times when we're talking about timing of these events, we're not necessarily able to make an immediate determination that something should have taken longer, more time or less time than what we're anticipating. Understand that these could be rapidly developing event, events depending on the circumstance. Here are some uh, lithium polymer cells uh, that are damaged. Um, and how they look. Those cells originated from packs like you see in the center. And as you can see, each of those packs contains two of those cells. And these, in this case, there are varying degrees of thermal damage. You know, some of the layers are, are damaged and burned away. Other ones are better shaped than others, but can have a variety of damage. Those same types of cells, when you do some computed tomography, so basically a CT, if you're not aware, is basically a 3D X-ray. So you take a bunch of different 2D X-rays of the object and you form them together using software and you create a three-dimensional image. And what this will allow us to do is do a non-destructive examination to see if we, if we find any unique areas of damage on the inside. It can help us tell the difference between intact cells, damaged cells. You can see, if you look at those cross sections that we take, you can see various areas of density. Those are actually arc beads that are formed simultaneously when all those different points of contact between the positive and negative layers touch each other during the failure. Here's another one with a little bit different damage. You can see in this case, we see some of the cell uh, layers having physically shifted. And again, this is just a non-destructive approach to determining if a cell has internal damage that's consistent with a failure. Here's a CT image of an 18650. 
Here you can see some of the external physical damage and we can try to overlay that with any corresponding internal damage. You see that the layers are not exactly uh, as well defined as in some of the other ones. You see various points of contact. You see there's a mandrel on the inside. Uh, that's that tube running down the center and that's supposed to allow gases that form during any type of heating event to pathway themselves up to the cap and vent the cell before it can catastrophically fail. You have to understand that heating of a cell is also gonna play a function in whether or not it catastrophically fails or fails in a way that it vents and no longer poses a threat. If I slowly heat up a battery, the, the transformation from those, those vapors, you know, as they progress is a slower event and allows the vent to do its job and release the pressure so you don't end up blowing off the top or catastrophically making contact between all the various layers. But if I heat it up fast enough, there's not enough time for that vent to operate. So a lot of times that's, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the integrated thermal protection not having an opportunity to do its job based on the circumstances of the failure. Here's a different cylindrical cell. This is not an 18650, but in this one, you can see the, the layers are all present. There's a little bit more uh, separation between them and you can have some more definition to the actual contents. But you also do see that there's a significant amount of shift of the contents from the bottom to the top. You have a little bit of uh, empty space at the bottom that you know is consistent with once this battery actually vents, all that pressure is gonna force the contents up towards the top where the cap is. In this case, you can see the cap is present. Those holes are there, what allowed the vent gases to get out. And in this case, it did its job, but you know, ultimately we can still do a comparison between like cells in this situation to see if this one differs from an adjacent one that looks like it. You know, you come across a cell phone battery in a fire, there's going to be some survivable components. Obviously, like a lot of things we come across, the plastics, plastics are going to be consumed. There's not going to be uh, much that you can find, but there's metal plates in it, and then you're going to have the battery itself. You unroll that lithium polymer battery, and, you know, you're looking for any layers that have perforations on them. And all the various layers uh, that are going to be in there can have different levels of damage inside to out, outside to in, and that may help determine whether or not you had sufficient exposure thermally from the outside to cause penetration and, and damage throughout the entire cell, or am I looking at just localized damage on the inside of the cell without consistent damage on the outside? And they can all help make a determination as to the level of involvement for this actual cell within a fire. It's actually a really good video um, that came up from uh, some work that was done in uh, Europe. And it's actually a high-speed camera uh, while it's real-time x-raying uh, an 18650 that they're heating. They put a heating coil on the bottom and they're heating it up. And what we'll notice as this is playing is those layers start to deform. You'll see bubbles start to form with the liquid that's being generated. And you'll see the gas start to form and make its way to the top, as you can see in some of the shadowing and stuff as you watch it. And I'll move this along just to kind of keep it going. Um, but eventually what you'll see is uh, you'll see the layers come in contact with each other when there's enough pressure to cause that catastrophic failure. You'll see arc beads form those again, those varying levels of metallic density in the X-ray itself everywhere contact was made. And we'll see uh, the cap blow off and the contents come out. You can see some of the, the mandrel in the center there shifting right now. You can see some more bubbles forming and flowing. You can see a little bit more uh, separation in the layers towards the top. You can see it's no longer a straight line the way that it was and the contents are starting to shift and you could again see some more bubbles flowing. So again, this is that electrolyte doing its thing bubbling and the battery has not yet you know, had a chance to vent the contents. And if it happens fast enough, which is what's gonna happen in this case, because we're, we're heating this externally, uh, we're gonna get a catastrophic failure and rupture. You can see the bubbles still forming. Yep, you saw that that shift in the contents that occurred there. And the mandrel is pretty much collapsed in on itself at that point. So now we have even less structural integrity on the inside to keep those layers in place. So we're allowing more shifting and the potential for the separator to not do its job and keep those the energized layers separated. And ultimately what ends up happening is you get deformity to the point where the cell actually fails and you get ejection and rupture and that's what ends up happening when you come across a lot of these 18650s with their contents either partially ejected or fully ejected. And it's coming up here and you can see there's a little bit more deformity. So I'm gonna let it just play out right now. And there you go. So now we had the catastrophic failure. 
we have those arc beads and we have the contents partially ejected. Uh, so the ATF CFI program uh, includes research projects that need to be done as a part of that 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 program. And I've had the, the pleasure of working with several of our CFIs. Um, several of the projects in the recent past have been lithium ion battery centric. Uh, one of the first ones we did was just to see what happens when you fail a lithium ion battery based vape pen. So in this video, uh, we have a pair of jeans with a vape that contains two 18650s within it. And we just externally heated the, the cylinders using a cartridge heater and we take a look at what happens. So there's a couple of things to notice. First of all, you can see there's ejected flaming contents and there was two, two events. So there's not only that, but you were able to get ignition of the, uh, the materials. There's some of the post-fire artifacts that came from that. You know, you can see that there's the 18650 canister. You can see some of the contents there that's ejected. You can see some of the contents left within it. Uh, think about this type of debris that you're trying to find in a fire scene though. This is almost like the situation where we're trying to find small electrical components from receptacles, uh, lamp holders, whatever it may be. If you don't know that you're looking for this kind of stuff to begin with, you may go out with the, the last shovel full, right? So, you know, consider your interview is an important part of determining whether or not any of these play a role, as well as being able to identify the, the remnants visually. So we take a look at this video. So obviously the that cell lands in a pretty ideal spot. So we're talking about, you know, the, a corner configured area with the sofa, vertical fabrics. We're talking about um, a lot of the uh, other stuff having to do with the, the crumpled carpet in that area. And investigators originally didn't know that the, uh, the battery that the dog was chewing on was involved. The homeowner came to them after the fact and said, hey, I have video. Uh, would you like to see it? And then that's how they were able to determine that this fire was actually caused while they weren't home by the dog chewing on what ultimately ended up being a battery. So the battery was actually their batteries that were on the charger being utilized for a vape. And there's uh, the battery. You could see a tooth mark there on the left. And on the right-hand side, you can see an intact version versus the damaged version. Uh, Los Angeles, California, this was actually an NRT activation. And what we saw over here was this was actually a vape shop. So if you remember this, uh, this fire, when it was in the news, there was 12, 11 or 12 firefighters that were injured. Um, there was a, a massive explosion downtown. There was a lot of factors involved with that. They had nitrous oxide, they had butane, a lot of the stuff involved with vapes. Um, but as any other vape shop has, it had uh, disposable and or rechargeable one or, or one hit vapes. So those vapes were all over our area of origin. And guess what they have within them? They have a small lithium ion battery. So one of the considerations we had to make was, did any of these batteries, the commodity that's being stored, get damaged and fail and result in the fire? And we did analysis on scene, including x-ray imaging, where in this case, we're able to see what they look like on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, you can see that they're intact in otherwise fire damaged vapes. Come across a scenario like this. This is another uh, NRT activation. It was in Hoboken, New Jersey. This was a double fatal warehouse fire. Um, pretty large facility and the area of origin was determined to be in a vape shop again, or a storage facility for a vape shop. Uh, I came across these light up LED rolling trays. So we found low burning in an area with a lot of commodities stored there. And these rolling trays actually have lithium batteries within them and they come charged, ready to go. When we came there to do the scene examination, we had uh, flashing lights all over the place and all of the damaged uh, trays that were dislodged during the fire suppression operations. So again, another item that has a lithium battery for consideration in fire causation. And it's quite easy for something like this. You know, I took that apart just using my, my bare hands and you can see that the battery is located right in there between thin pieces of plastic. You know, think about this getting physically damaged and then going into thermal runaway. It's definitely a possibility. Go. So the vapes, you know, they consist of a uh, battery, 
there's a tank containing the uh, the oil, a coil. So as you heat that oil up, you're able to produce the vapor, and those are the large clouds, quote unquote, that they make. But you know, when you think about a vape, uh, they modify them, and you're trying to get larger clouds. What are some options for that? Perhaps you can put a higher wattage coil within the assembly. So you put a higher wattage coil inside your assembly, and you're using your originally issued battery with the vape, and it's maybe dying a lot quicker than you want it to because you're using more power every time you take a draw. So next you go and get a third party battery that has a larger capacity and you put it inside your vape. Maybe now you're mismatching the chargers associated with the previous cell and the new cell that you're using in, in this vape. So when you mismatch things, what's the worst case scenario? Ultimately the battery can break down and have a failure. One of the issues that can occur in that, in that scenario is a failure that results in perhaps ejection of the mouthpiece and if that hits you in your sinus cavity, you can die. So that's what happened here in St. Petersburg, Florida. It was a case that we were involved with. It was a lithium battery failure of the vape that he was modding and it failed while it was in use and killed the person. Another project that we did had to do with uh, lithium ion battery failures versus airline interiors. So you know that we talked about the example that I mentioned below, uh, before, sorry, where uh, when I was on the plane, um, they tell you not to pack rechargeable lithium batteries into the cargo hold because they want to be able to handle a situation that occurs. So one of our candidates wanted to do an evaluation of a failed battery within something common like a duffel bag and see how that fire presents itself relative to interior components such as the seating. So this is a, an accelerated clip just to show the failure. You see the two pops, you get ignition, the bag itself goes based on that flaming failure. And ultimately you get a a fire that gets pretty involved within the uh, space itself. This is another one where we did the same same thing and we did it into a uh, an overhead compartment. So as you can see, you know whether you're event limited or not, or you have the number of cells failing, they all contribute to fire growth in these situations, and ultimately you can have a very smoky situation within the cabin. You have flame that's coming out of these and all these components are fire rated, but obviously that's to a point. So we conducted another project with another CFI candidate where we wanted to evaluate the compounds that were generated as a result of a lithium ion battery fire. This is a big area of study right now because there's a lot of concern about the, the gases being produced, the water runoff. In this case, we worked with the University of Texas and we analyzed the compounds in the fire debris after a battery was put into thermal runaway. Uh, when you look at the MSDS sheets for a typical 18650 lithium ion battery, uh, these are the components that are gonna be in it. Um, the lithium hexafluorophosphate is gonna be associated with your electrolyte and, and whatnot. And as a result, you know, you have the potential to develop some, some compounds. Uh, they did a variety of tests you know, including pH, x-ray powder diffraction, ion chromatography. They use an SEM basically to identify all the compounds and materials that were in the debris. They did the various analysis and identified the, the concentrations of what you're gonna be coming across. Some of them were hazardous, some of them were not. Um, and here's some of the uh, other results. There's the SEM showing a lot of the compounds. Uh, one of the things that is a big part of the conversation one of the things that's a big part of the conversation right now is uh, heavy metals associated with the uh, batteries and the, the, the oxides that are produced in the vapors and how they etch, etch on various materials. So that's a concern that's being discussed. Uh, one of the biggest uh, issues is the hydrofluoric, hydrogen fluoride and the resulting hydrofluoric acid that's created when you mix it with water. Uh, those are toxins that are, present a danger to all of us. Um, obviously, you shouldn't be licking fire debris on any fire scene to begin with, but just like anything else, you shouldn't be handling these things with your bare hands. And we're also still evaluating the airborne components. Uh, we just recently did some testing where we're trying to develop more information of that. We're going to be working with the DOT and other organizations uh, and, and other people are working on this as well, like UL, just to identify the concentrations of these gases uh, and especially the explosive gases, because we can also create a situation beyond the health and safety considerations. We can create a fuel air environment where we can have an explosion as a result of the failure of these these types of batteries. Uh, so 18650s, we, we looked at them and we said, well, when they fail, we're noticing that the contents is being ejected. So how far exactly can this contents be ejected? 
So we had a project uh, that was done where we took an 18650, we heated it in the center of our large burn room, we laid down a lot of debris, uh, sorry, cheesecloth, and then we analyzed where the debris landed. Uh, here's just some still shots. And what's interesting about this is you see that uh, sign on the back that says emergency pull station with that metallic housing that actually protects uh, the fire alarm system pull station in the large burn room. That's about 60 feet away from the center where the battery was failed. So as you can see, we do have some flaming debris that's located, you know, remote from the battery failure point. But take a look at this shot. We got actually a flaming portion of the battery land 60 feet away on top of the actual metallic housing and continue to burn there. So think about a scenario where you come across a fire scene where the cell failure doesn't occur within the area of origin or a point of failure for the battery, but the ignition is 60 feet away. And not only that, but you saw how you can come across a circumstance where you have multiple points of ignition. The vape test we did, this test we did, you see multiple points of failure. Here's a video that'll play. And if you come across a scenario with uh, that's unwitnessed and you find uh, multiple points of uh, unconnected, uncommunicated burning, that may uh, lead you down a path if you don't consider the fact that a, li a lithium battery failing can produce you know, flaming ejected material at various points. So you can see on the top right, we have a thermal imaging camera, which will show the hot spots. We have the cell itself in the top left there. We put a thermal couple on it just to see the temperatures that we're reaching. There it goes, it vented, but after it vented, we can, it continued to heat inside thermally and it goes into thermal runaway and there you go. You have ejection, ejection of the contents and some hot spots that land pretty far away. If you look at the, uh, the bottom, the cheesecloth was actually put there because we could easily find the, the debris and the flaming ignition associated, whether it's with liquid electrolyte that came out or flaming contents, they land on the cheesecloth and provide a suitable, easily uh, ignited fuel for us to be able to keep track of that. Here's an example of a laptop that's charging, left in an office space in England. He only picked up this, uh, this video footage because his intrusion alarm picked up this failure. So as you can see, this is a charging battery and you have ejected material all over the office. Now you consider an office space with suitable fuels all over the place with those piloted flaming ignition points. And you can see how this can be presented as an issue for a fire investigation after the fact. So if you didn't know to ask or find the post fire laptop within the debris and then be able to identify its battery as being intact versus uh, damaged and then be able to determine whether or not that damage is consistent with impingement after the fact of a fire starting remote or as a result of failure in the area of origin itself, that would be difficult to figure out. So we did individual cells and then we said, well, there's a lot of situations in which individual cells are grouped together to form a battery pack. So in this project, uh, we evaluated the debris dispersion and failure associated with a battery pack that contains, such as this, multiple 18650s. So common 18 volt uh, Milwaukee, depending on the number of amp hours, whether it's a two, four, six amp hour battery pack can de determine the number of cells within it. You can see that this blown apart diagram shows 10 18650s within it. So. We did the same test where we uh, induced failure using a cartridge heater and we observed what happened. Sometimes we got some ejected content, sometimes we didn't. But ultimately in this case, you also notice that the plastic housing of the battery pack itself also ignites. So now you have basically a pilot ignition source for whatever's next to it. And that's gonna be much more uh, capable of lighting a lot of fuels than just the battery itself failing. So take that into consideration when you're evaluating uh, whether or not a battery could have played a role. As you can see, every time there's a, a spark or flame show, that's another one of the cells going off. So the, the, the failure is propagating. As you had the initial cell failure, it moves to the next, to the next, to the next. And ultimately, the battery is going to keep going until all of the uh, cells fail or if you're able to extinguish it. And we'll talk about that a little bit because extinguishing a fire like this is something that needs to be considered. So speaking of battery packs, here's one that recently came up out of South Dakota. Um, this is a Dewalt battery pack, and you can't see it on the left-hand side picture perfectly, but there's supposed to be 10 cells there, just like on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, we're actually missing one of the cells. So you can see uh, one of the cells is missing, but we have a little bit of the differential damage again that we're talking about. We have multiple cells there where the contents is still present, but we have one cell which obviously got 
displaced in a way that the cap was left over and it displaced the contents. So the question becomes, how does that happen in a uniform exposure situation versus a cell having an issue and resulting in a failure? So that can be helpful in determining whether or not this battery pack is part of the cause or a victim of the fire. So again, uh, a larger conversation started to take place about, well, you know, we have a battery pack that, that had an internal failure. Is there any way to look at them in the field to help determine the differences between a battery pack that has an internal failure or a battery pack that's impinged upon externally by fire. So this was from Spokane, Washington, a couple of weeks ago, where it actually turned into an impromptu uh, lithium ion battery town hall. So if you go online and search uh, for that, you'll see some information. Uh, but what we did was we took Ryobi battery packs that were made available to us. And in this kind of situation, we induced an internal failure where we, again, used a cartridge heater in place of one of the batteries and allowed it to go into thermal runaway. That stick that you see there, that was the local hazmat and natural resources uh, personnel. They were taking air monitoring and samples during the failure to see if they could get any uh, measurable levels of hydrogen fluoride and other components like carbon monoxide, everything else that typically comes off in a fire. Uh, the, the National Guard uh, civil service team also, civil support team also came out and they were doing real time GCMS for us. So that's something that we're working on putting together. The actual metallic buckets below collect the suppression water that was utilized in order to analyze the runoff to see if we got any measurable levels of hydrofluoric acid. You could see battery failed, vented, did its thing. There's another cell that vented. Again, you have those vapors and the gases coming out. And then ultimately you can get a catastrophic failure that results in a lot of combustible gases accumulating in the space and you get flaming ignition. So we can compare that to a situation where we run the same test, but this time we externally impinge upon it. You just used a propane torch and impinged upon the battery from the outside. Uh, so the external impingement and the internal failure were on the same end. So we can do some comparison as to the types of damage for the remaining cells. But as you can see, the ultimate result is going to be similar visually from the outside. You know, you're going to get venting of individual cells. You're going to get a catastrophic failure. So just uh, somebody seeing a battery fail or, or finding a battery alone doesn't necessarily give you the answer. So we're going to continue to do more analysis on the, the data that was generated from there. But I mean, for example, a lot of the information we're trying to, to develop from that is field generated data. So you, nobody, nobody's going to have a portable CT scanner, but a lot of people do have actual access to portable x-ray imaging. So top right there is an intact cell, which shows the, the, the 20 cells that are present in within it. And then the bottom left and bottom right show varying degrees of damage with cells which have their contents ejected. So we're trying to perhaps correlate the level of damage and the location of the damage relative to where a cell failed in the cell versus when it was impinged upon from the outside. So that's hopefully some information that we're going to have that comes uh, in the near future. You know, these are not also these are not always small scale individual cells or battery packs involved in the fires. So if you, I don't know if you heard about this fire, but this was in Morris, Illinois. I got a call uh, about this, and they said, uh, "What do we what do we have going on here?" This was an abandoned paper mill that was being utilized as a lithium iron phosphate recycling center. So the local fire department, the local AHJ, had no idea this was going on. When they had a fire, the fire department showed up and they saw a pallet of parts of lithium iron battery, lithium iron phosphate batteries being separated and a fire had started in one of them. So the responding chief uh, remembered that lithium in its elemental form is very reactive like uh, potassium or magnesium with water. So they limited the amount of water they put on the uh, fire. That resulted in the fire growing to a massive uh, situation that involved approximately 200 tons of batteries that were in the facility. They tried to utilize a thousand pounds of purple K to put the fire out and the, the chief was quoted as saying the fire laughed at them. Um, they ultimately ended up having to evacuate over a thousand homes. Uh, the EPA currently has one of those super fun sites set up to monitor the, the ground and because of the groundwater and everything. And ultimately they ended up using 28 tons of dry Portland cement in order to smother the fire. But by that point they had been flowing with master streams, master streams for about four days. So, 
cooling adjacent cells in a situation like that is what kind of prevents the, the, fa the fire from propagating. You're not going to actually put out the actual lithium fire itself. So here's a lithium iron phosphate battery, the type of cells we were talking about from that incident. Uh, these are considered the deep cycle battery of the lithium ion battery world. And what that means is that um, they're used in a lot of applications where you have solar energy storage systems. Um, a lot of times RVs utilize these in those, uh, those situations where they have stored energy that's going to be uh, charged and discharged uh, on a deep cycle basis. So it's going to be common to come across something like that. Here's a video that just shows. Some of that uh, elemental lithium in, in water, uh, but there it's important to remember that the lithium is actually dissolved in electrolyte and salt format in a battery and it's not elemental lithium. So uh, if you read any product liter literature from the manufacturers right now, the best extinguishing means for your personnel is going to be flowing copious amounts of water. Uh, here's a case that was brought to my attention. Uh, they were asking me what was going on over here. And I was like, well, let's see what, what we have. And they had this video. This is uh, about, you can see on the time there, three o'clock in the morning in Philadelphia. Nail salon, perhaps in a time of, uh, you know, a point in time right now where businesses aren't doing as well as they can be. And, you know, fire occurs in a structure like this at 3 a.m. Who knows what did it? If you notice on the tabletops, there's almost a, a whitish, bluish, light glowing thing. Just pay attention to that, but also just pay attention in the video uh, onto the actual where the fire starts. And we'll talk about it. So at first I looked at this and I said, I don't know what that is, but there's obviously something there. And they're also on the other tables. So we did a little bit of digging into it and it's a UV nail lamp. Uh, so these are utilized to set nail gel using a UV light and unbeknownst to us until we researched it, they all contain a rechargeable lithium battery. And that's because when they're not being utilized on a uh, workstation, like you saw in the video, they can be taken out onto the deck wherever the uh, customer may be. And it can be utilized while they're sitting there sipping their mimosa. So all those batteries were constantly in charge and use sitting on the tables and ultimately one of them had a catastrophic failure resulting in the fire at three o'clock in the morning. This is a My Charge power bank. I was contacted by one of our CFICs in North Carolina. You can see pretty limited area of damage. In this case, you know, we can kind of look at this battery pack and see, all right, we have some localized differential damage. The entire thing is not fire damage, but obviously something ripped a hole through it when those batteries vented. So we may, may have an issue. So that was kind of considered. Ironically, that same weekend, I get contacted about the same exact My Charge power bank causing a fire in Camden, New Jersey. So there is a recall actually out there for these, but you know, be aware that you'll come across these types of devices during your fire investigations and what they may look like. Here's a video of a fire that occurred in Salem, Oregon. Take a look at that right-hand side. You see the flashes in the window there. This is a double fatal fire actually. So you saw we had the flashes um, go to investigate the, uh, the scene and what do we come across as a part of this uh, consideration for the origin and cause. We have a pretty good idea of the origin, but for the cause, we have two uh, electronic mobility devices or scooters that were actually being charged at the time. So a part of the analysis required examination of these uh, at the laboratory because they were submitted for examination and inclusion or elimination in the uh, investigation. A lot of times the, the failures can result in, in those flashes because like we've seen in the individual cell exercises that we showed, you get that catastrophic failure in the, in the ignition of the vapors. So understand also that those individual cell tests that we do, they expand and extrapolate to larger packs. So even though we did testing on a singular cell or you're watching videos about single cells, they, they, they affect your analysis on larger packs. Here's a great video from Roosevelt Avenue in Queens, New York. So background of this is you'll see a guy pull up with a scooter and he has replacement battery packs for that scooter on the back of his bike tied down. And these are all closed roll up doors for the rear entrance to a club that's not in operation at the time and take a look at what happens. Drops the battery pack, immediate failure, now what's gonna happen? The, the fire is gonna propagate to additional cells in the pack. We're gonna get worse and worse, but pay attention. You know, the door's open right now, but he's trying to do what he can. He gets his e-bike out of the way. He slips, yep, he comes. Door's shut, cells are being ejected. He tries to put it out with his extinguisher. Does it work? 
No. And this is what we're talking about. Take a look at those ejected cells, though, and take a look at that roll-up door there. If you see there's one that actually kind of made its way right underneath the roll-up door, what do you think ha happens now? So now, not only do we have the failure of a battery pack outside of the structure for an e-bike, but we have ejected cells that now, as you watch the video as it progresses, ultimately result in a fire at the structure. So imagine coming across this fire scene without having this video to look at and determine whether or not those batteries on the outside were a result of a fire on the inside somehow or what was going on here. And as you can see, this fire gets bigger and bigger. The, one of those cells rolled right under into that corner. You can see the fire developing on the inside now. And we get a pretty big fire that develops from this. As you've seen in the news, New York City is dealing with an epidemic of e-bike related fires. Um, I'll mention on the next video about the one that happened a couple of weeks ago. But as you can see now, we have a pretty involved structure fire now as a result of a battery failure outside on the sidewalk that resulted in ejected contents into the structure. Um, so take this into consideration when you're trying to evaluate the possibilities for causes, as well as whether or not the battery has to be in the area of origin where the fire starts in the structure. There's a photo of the battery pack on the right that's not damaged, and there it is on the left after the fact. Uh, you can see we have a bunch of 18650s. We have various states of damage. We have some of them with their contents ejected. We are obviously missing some of the cells as we saw in the video when they were ejected. And uh, doing a comparison like this between an intact pack and a fire damaged pack is very useful. Just like in any type of electrical analysis, doing an examination of an exemplar versus the actual fire damaged product can, can help out a lot. So, about two weekends ago, there was a fire at a high rise in, in, in Manhattan and they, the FDNY did a rope rescue. And what a lot of people have heard on the news uh, was that there was an e-bike involved. So it's typically like an e-bike like you saw before or the e-bike that you see here in this UL video that recently came out. And what's ended up, ending up happening in, in the city and a lot, of, a lot of jurisdictions, people are buying e-bikes like this used secondhand. And that's what one of those bikes in that apartment was. It was bought off the street to be a gift for somebody, they plugged it in to charge in the hallway near the exit and they were taking a nap and they the, the battery failed while it was being charged. It doesn't necessarily have to be charging when it fails. As we've seen in various examples here, I've showed several batteries that were not necessarily being charged but just have been impacted externally by heat. So all we're doing when we externally Im impact them is put them into thermal runaway. So we're taking any of those possible failure modes, whether it's mechanical damage, external heating, overcharging, over discharging, whatever it may be, putting the battery into thermal runaway and you get the fire like you saw. So that rope rescue related fire was, uh, the cause of it was an e-bike such as these, one of these scooters stored in the hallway of the apartment. After it failed, the, uh, the male occupant of the apartment was able to jump over it and get out. He tried to encourage the woman to jump, jump over the fire and get out. She couldn't do so, and she ended up having to be rescued the way you saw. Here is a video that UL, UL obviously produces a lot of great information, and we work with them. They attended the symposium that we did in, uh, in Spokane. They attended the, Spoke, the, the FDNY symposium where I presented as well. They recently did this test, um, and it shows overcharging of a scooter within a bedroom environment and what ends up happening. And notice how rapidly this situation develops, the gases that are produced, and decide for yourself if uh, anybody's gonna have a chance in a situation like this and whether or not you would consider this a Compton ignition scenario. So there's a couple things to notice in that video that there was a pretty big overpressure event. Um, there was a lot of gases being produced and UL is doing a lot of work right now to quantify those gases and determine what type of uh, fuel air mix we're getting in a battery situation where we don't necessarily get ignition of the vapors, but we accumulate them in a confined space. Now we have the potential for an explosion. Electric vehicles obviously are a major concern. Here's a diagram that shows uh, the old configuration of 18650s within a module and then several modules being used in a Tesla Model S. So again, it's scalable. The information we're talking about on a single cell applies to a larger pack in a situation like this. 
Here's a good cross section that shows the actual battery pack within the frame chat within the chassis of the vehicle with various cutaways showing those cells within the battery pack. Here's an example of that gray market situation uh, where somebody buys one of these and starts taking it apart to take a look at it, but it also gives us great images. You can see the battery pack on the top left, the battery pack with its uh, housing removed to the top right, the cover. There's a module on the top, bottom left, and then you can see the individual cells on the bottom right. So as a part of that Spokane testing, we actually had the opportunity to induce failure in a 2018 Tesla Model 3 battery burn uh, battery pack. So this actually contains roughly, instead of 7,000 18650s, it contains uh, about 3,000 of the types that we were talking about that are 2170s. The newer, latest version of Tesla's batteries are those 4680s. This includes that fire that you see there, and I don't have all the videos, everything processed yet to show and share, but that fire that you're seeing there was purely the battery pack itself. So we're talking about the contents of the battery pack, no other fuels. We induced failure by taking a nail gun and driving a nail through the top of the metal enclosure. So again, this battery pack is located within the chassis of a vehicle. It's protected from some damage, but all we had to do was take a nail gun and drive it through the top and it went through and put the battery and thermal runaway. This ended up burning for about an hour and 45 minutes continuously. The fire department originally tried to extinguish it and I gave them the option. I said, you can try to extinguish this, but we'll probably be here for the next eight to 24 hours because as you cool it down, you're not necessarily putting the fire out. You're just preventing it from propagating soon enough. So the cell failed, the electrolyte ignited, the vapors are going, and we're heating the adjacent cells. And we have about 3,000 of them. So I said, you have the option to flow as much water as you think you can here and try to extinguish this, um, or we can let it burn out. And within an hour and 45 minutes, all the contents of the battery pack was burned out. But you get a fairly large fire from the battery pack alone. So imagine something like this in a, in a vehicle fire. So we were joking out there, uh, if people start to use Teslas and drive-bys, let's say you take uh, you know, a round to the side of the battery pack or something, maybe we can induce a failure like this as well. But that could be a self-correcting problem, who knows. Uh, here's in a situation where we had a Tesla involved in a fire. This is from one of our CFIs in the Boston metro area. So word is on this, they took the Tesla in, they were installing a slide out rack in the trunk area and they were drilling into the Tesla itself to put the mounting bracket in and guess what they did? They penetrated the battery pack, just like I showed you, and it resulted in a localized fire. This one didn't propagate to the adjacent cells because it was able to be contained. And again, just like the 18650s have those integrated protections, Teslas have integrated protection built into the design of the battery pack. All those metal tabs connecting the cells, the positive and negative terminals, are fusible links. So if something overheats or there's an overcurrent, it's supposed to blow the link and isolate the cell. There's non-combustible packing in between. But the problem is if something goes into thermal runaway and those get don't get a chance to cool it down or prevent it from propagating to the next cell fast enough, you're not gonna prevent the breakdown and further development of the fire. Here's another Tesla battery pack related fire. This was in Palo Alto. I was contacted because these were located outside. They weren't installed in a vehicle. They were on pallets waiting to be installed as replacement batteries. Uh, the funny part about this one was this Tesla repair facility is located right next to a McLaren dealership. Luckily, none of the McLarens were damaged. But there you go. We have the battery packs with a lot of the cells ejected on various levels of damage post-fire in this situation. Again, battery packs sitting out in the sun, if there was a manufacturing defect, external heating, whatever it may be, physical damage, maybe the forklift that picked up these battery packs when it was on the, uh, the pallets damaged one of them. Maybe they dropped one of them and didn't say anything. And when it sits there, ultimately it can go into thermal runaway. It doesn't have to be in use or charging at the time. And remember all those toxic components that we talked about, those are not necessarily affected by the state of charge. The state of charge is going to affect how energetic the failure is, whether or not you get that massive explosion or whether or not it just vents and doesn't do anything. But ultimately the contents of the batteries are still there. So when they do burn, they're going to end up producing those same toxic compounds. Here's a great story with a BMW i3, another full electric vehicle. This was in Washington state. The story goes, this person moved, uh, bought a, a new house at the top of a uh, logging road, and they had to quote, move boulders out of the way in order to drive this vehicle up. So they're driving, they smell something burning, they stop, they take a look and they're not sure what's going on. They drive a little bit more, they stop again, and they see uh, more smoke being produced. She can't get a signal on her cell phone. So she walks up the rest of the road to her house, calls 911, they show up and this is what's left. A pile of aluminum, axles, and that's it. So you can see the nature of the road there. And I looked in the BMW manual. There's nothing that says that you shouldn't off-road a BMW i3, but based on what we know now about physical damage potential and the, uh, 
the location of the battery low in the vehicle, is it possible that something got damaged during the course of use, resulting in this catastrophic failure and fire that results in this pool of aluminum? Yeah, it's definitely possible. And I know a lot of fire investigators out there will look at this pile without knowing the circumstances and tell me exactly where that fire started, but you're better than I am. That's really tough at this point. So here's just a quick case study that kind of hopefully ties together a little bit about what we're talking about. This was actually a national response team call out in Puerto Rico. Uh, Motopack is actually a warehouse type situation where they have various uh, motor products for trucks, cars, repair facilities. Um, the fire department ventilated the entire structure for a fire that started in one of the bays. And this is what ends up happening. That's a different conversation that I think you've already covered uh, in the Dakari series with flow pads and, and such. Nonetheless, we were able to determine based on witness interviews that the fire originated in this transmission repair shop. Uh, furthermore, we arc mapped it and we were able to put the fire in the front half of the repair shop. As you can see, excavated it out, worked towards the front. That truck was on that lift, which was up in the air at the time of the fire. And during interviews, we tried to identify what we tried to identify what was going on here. So one of the things that they mentioned to us is that two individuals were working under this truck and they had left two tool trays with lithium battery powered power tools on the trays. So, okay. And wherever you see a red, red, or sorry, green flagging tape in the pictures, those are the locations of lithium batteries that were found associated with the two tools. So we had an intact tool and we had a fire damage tool. So we right away have differential damage, right? So we're asking ourselves, why is one tool intact and another tool have its contents ejected in various locations. So we talked to them some more and one of them happens to mention, yeah, earlier in the day when I was working on the car about six feet off the ground, I dropped my power tool and it hit the ground, the concrete floor. All right, so now we have the potential for physical damage. So again, we find various cells ejected from one and on the other one, we find them still within the tool. Here's some of the stuff that we excavated and kind of sorted through just like you do in any origin area just to identify a cause. And Guess where we find one of the ejected cells from the area underneath the area where they were working on that truck, right where that green flagging tape is with the remnants of what is a, uh, a an office chair. So during the interviews, uh, the last person that was in the structure had mentioned to us that they saw a fire that looked like it elevated halfway up this chain link fence. That chain link fence was around the back wall and there was various uh, cardboard and rubber parts hanging from there. Uh, besides that, they had heard pops before the fire, which could be some of the audible sounds that we heard with a lithium battery failure. So now we have the potential for that. And we know from the testing and other experience that um, the ejection of flaming material and or cells is possible during one of these failures. So is it possible that physical damage earlier in the day to a rechargeable lithium power battery based power tool caused it to catastrophically fail, ejecting a cell immediately on the chair, creating that elevated fire from the seat of the chair up the way that it presented and being supported by some of the patterns here. You can see there's kind of like a V pattern going down to that uh, chair area and makes sense with the witness statements. And the answer to that was, yeah, it all made sense. So this is an example of how we use a lot of what we've been talking about with regards to evaluating whether or not a lithium battery could have been the cause of a fire. That's pretty much everything I have for you. So. I'll turn it over to Bill. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. We do have a few questions here. Um, if you stop sharing your screen and you pull up the chat, <clears throat> you'll be able to see them too, but I'll go ahead and uh, read them up here. Stand by. So if anybody has any questions, uh, go ahead and post them in the, in the chat. Uh, I want to just scroll back here. And I'm looking at Charles's post here. It says, any idea of uh, using lithium batteries and boats for electric trolling motors and considering the effect of using a 12 volt lithium series to create 24 to 36 volts for that motor? Yeah, so I mean, they use various voltage lithium batteries, just like you can use a 12 volt car battery and create a 24 volt system. Uh, the key thing there is if you're mixing and matching batteries or creating a situation where you're creating your own battery pack assembly, um, the batteries themselves should definitely have something integrated to be able to monitor voltage when you're charging them and whatnot. But obviously it's not gonna have the benefit of a 24 volt manufactured battery system, which perhaps has 
balancing associated with the charging for the various cells and a potential for issue presents itself. The other issues that can present themselves in a boat environment, which we've had a couple so far come up, is obviously corrosion, uh, saltwater environments, depending on where you are, just like they affect electrical connections in, in a conventional electrical system, whether it be for a boat or a structure, they can also impact the terminals associated with battery packs and lithium batteries. So let's say you have a battery pack that's fully charged, partially charged, and you have salt creating an arc tracking potential across the external terminals, the exterior terminals of the battery pack, you can have a failure because you're now slowly discharging this battery consistently over time, perhaps heating it internally, and it can result in a failure. So I have heard of the idea that full electric uh, boats are coming to the market, just like I just got notified that there's a full lithium battery powered locomotive that's going into uh, New York City for one of the, the train situations. And everybody's kind of discussing, all right, when, when that battery fails, and I'm not talking about a diesel electric situation, I'm talking about a giant battery that's charged and then put into service. Uh, so we're not sure how that's going to end up being yet, but we're going to do some more testing in tunnel environment related failures. But yeah, a boat related situation can result in failures that we talked about if you take into consider everything we talked about, but it can be done to create those 24 volt systems as well. That's crazy. Uh, there's some comments here about uh, the effects of the fire for these battery fires on concrete bridges and, and parking decks. Yeah, so one of the conversations that has come up from the symposiums is not only the batteries uh, and the fire effects, but you saw the amount of gases that were produced. I think they estimate it's a seven to one ratio of gas being produced from an 18650 volume wise. So when that's one 18650. So imagine a battery pack is 10 of them and imagine an old Tesla Model S has 7,000 18650s in it. So once you're in a parking garage situation, let's say you have a battery failure and you're producing flammable gas vapors that are accumulating in a parking garage, you now have the expl explosion potential for any type of ignition source. So that's something that's being evaluated. Think about when you go out in, in the field, where are the electric vehicle charging packs? They're, they're all clustered together, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 of them together. So if I do have a car that has a failure and I it does eventually ignite, what am I doing to the adjacent car next to it? I'm also heating it up. So now you have a cascading, propagating, compounding effect for the battery failures. And that's what's not necessarily taken into account in the current analysis, whether it's fire protection wise, fire suppression wise, and or for us to consider after the fact, you know? Crazy. Uh, as far as Tesla and the 18650s they're using, do you know if they're gonna go to a, a more of a cell phone style? Um, no, so the Tesla is moving right now to a 4680. So it's a, it's a, a, a larger diameter and larger height battery. If you go back to that picture that I showed, that's where they're going to. However, uh, all of the manufacturers are also doing research right now to try and eliminate the hydrocarbon-based electrolyte. So instead of having a hydrocarbon-based liquid that's you know obviously combustible in the event of a failure, they're actually looking to move to a solid state lithium battery. Uh, those kind of things exist, right? When you think about the dime cell battery or button cell battery that you have, those are lithium solid state batteries, but people don't use them because of cost prohibit prohibitations as well as materials but they're trying to do more research on those. But the problem is that those are like 10 plus years out right now. Um, they are also working on different chemistries. So besides Tesla, obviously there's several other electric vehicle manufacturers. So lithium sulfur batteries, for example, all of those toxic compounds that I mentioned are for conventional batteries right now being used. The same thing will apply depending on the changing of the chemistries and who knows what type of compounds are being produced, but we're trying to do more and more analysis to see if we have to be concerned with those things after the fact as well. Awesome. Are you seeing more cylinder type failures or versus the pouch style failures? So the, the cylinder type failures are unique because they act like a rocket motor when they do fail. So that's where you get the ejection and they travel great distances and they can create, you know, fires remote from the point of failure or even, you know, the area of origin. You may have multiple spot fires like you saw in some of the videos. The pouch type batteries, they do get an overpressure event just the same way where the electrolyte, you know, starts to build up pressure and gas. And as a result, they, they rupture, they can have the flaming ejection and whatnot, but they tend to stay in the same location where the fire occurs. And typically that's gonna be your laptop, that's gonna be your iPad, that's gonna be your cell phone situation. A lot of those e-bikes also use several pouch type or prismatic cells put in series in a larger container. Think of like a 50 cal ammo can. So a lot of homemade bike people take a 50 cal ammo can and put a bunch of pouch type batteries vertically stacked almost like a file folder in them or you can buy 
just like you saw in that one Roosevelt Avenue video, a bunch of 8650s, 18650s, tie them together, solder all the terminals together and make your own large battery pack. And of course, just like any other homemade job, you're, you're asking for trouble when you don't take into account all the engineering that goes into preventing fires from them. So, yeah. Have you seen any arson cases yet where people are trying to purposely fail them? So we had a case, uh, actually an ATF case in Georgia, where uh, a man used a lithium battery powered uh, power pack to initiate an incendiary device. We had that. It was a battery pack associated with a GSM device, and he initiated it remotely to, to set off fireworks in the vicinity of liquid gasoline. And of course, that was too rich, and it didn't end up killing the person, but it ended up burning them. This was in a car. So after his wife left for work, he said he texted the uh, GSM board. It closed a relay, which allowed the lithium batteries to power this uh, bridge wire, which set off the fireworks and then melted the two 16 ounce bottles of gasoline. Um, so that's one that we saw like that. I haven't seen anybody necessarily uh, utilizing the battery itself as an incendiary device, but obviously, as you've seen in some of the videos, there is the potential for that, depending on if somebody wanted to, uh, I guess, get creative along those routes. Yeah. So how are fire departments uh, extinguishing these fires other than thousands so, of gallons of water? So this is the, uh, this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, you know, when we were in FDN, at FDNY, the symposium, there's about 300 people there. They had industry panel, a panel of industry experts from, from regulatory agencies, manufacturers, UL, their chief scientist was there. A bunch of different people were there. Um, the short answer was that there's no other product right now, whether it be foam, whether it be dry chemical products, whether it be uh, metal fire extinguishing agents, uh, CO2, none of that stuff is effective because of the way the lithium batteries break down and burn. And the copious amounts of water that's quoted from whether it's Tesla's firefighting guide or any of the other manufacturers is because you're trying to prevent propagation and heating of further cells. So for example, if you come across a Tesla wall fire in a garage at somebody's home, Tesla's firefighting tactics will tell them right away, be defensive, protect your exposures, and try to prevent propagation to adjacent uh, Tesla walls or products. Don't necessarily try to, you know, successfully extinguish the one fire and think that it's out. Um, they're seeing vehicle fires that are being towed after the fact reignite up to 24 and 72 hours later at the tow yards because they they dump about 5,000 gallons of water on it. They assume it's extinguished. Uh, some of the cells haven't gone off yet, but they're still heating internally. They tow it away. So now this is a concern for secondary responders, right? They take the towed vehicle, they put it in a tow yard. And in one case, they had it next to the tow yard structure. And now you have a large fire. Um, I think San Francisco, they had one where it reignited 72, 72 hours after the fact from a highway related incident. That's crazy. Do you know if they've tried uh, using ultra high pressure yet to extinguish any of those? I haven't, but uh, I do know that some people are trying to integrate suppression systems into the pack assembly itself. So when you think about like the Tesla battery pack that I showed, they're trying to almost plummet with suppression systems. And, and actually that's what's done for a lot of those large energy storage systems that you see out West with the solar farms. Those Connex boxes that have battery packs in them, those are pre-plumbed with uh, suppression systems, but not high pressure suppression or anything like that. Um, however, those haven't necessarily been successful in extinguishing a fire. The Connex box though, does a good job at containing the fire. That being said, uh, there was a, an incident in Arizona that you guys can look up where the fire department responded. Uh, the fire had extinguished itself, but obviously all those vapors had accumulated inside. As soon as they opened the Connex box, uh, you had a suitable mix and it caused an explosion and injured several members. Do you have any more information about the train, the electric train that's coming? Is there somewhere someone can Google that? Uh, so that is actually one of the things I'm working on with Long Island Railroad. So the MTA, who is the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in New York State, runs Long Island Railroad, New York City Transit, Metro North, all those agencies. They built uh, a couple of years ago what's called the Eastside Access Project. It goes from Long Island into uh, Manhattan, and it's a brand new tunnel that was dug. Uh, for whatever reason, cost-cutting measures probably, the size of the tunnel isn't suitable for a diesel work train. So because of that, uh, they sourced uh, from one of the manufacturers a full electric uh, train that is smaller and can, can do the job of when you don't have third rail power available underground. So if, for example, after flooding from like a hurricane like Sandy or 
if you have to do repair work and you can't have it energized, you need to have the diesel locomotive. But in this case, they'll be using this. I don't have the, uh, I do have information on it, but I don't know if they want me to share that information yet, just because it's an ongoing thing uh, and they're expecting delivery. And we are planning to work with them as well as the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and do some tunnel related electric vehicle fire testing to see if the infrastructure, fire suppression capability, as well as fire department tactics are suitable for electric vehicle or electric transport modes in those kind of scenarios. Jeez. I feel like I'm drinking from a five inch hose here. Mm. There's a there's a comment here asking about uh, a change of use of occupancy. It was posted at 708. Are you able to see that comment? Scroll, I'm scrolling up 708, you said? 708, uh, TAPPE, T-A-P-P-E. Says you have a retail occupancy selling e-bikes. Oh, so so one of the members, I, I I didn't find the question. I'm scrolling, but I can answer the what I think the question is. So one of the NFPA as well as other code officials were there at the symposium in New York City, and one of the conversations was this may need to be you may need to start treating this for quantities in storage in a building. For example, New York City just banned storage of e-bikes within an apartment in a, in a public housing building. So it may be where they you know, end up providing a special two hour rated fire room or something for them where you can park them. But that conversation was taking place. However, there are no current regulatory agencies that require limitations on whether it's occupancy or anything having to do with that. There are limitations on shipping and other things for for them so one of the tests we did in spokane was you know all these lithium battery recycling centers that you come across where people drop off their dead batteries or burned or damaged batteries those end up getting shipped to recycling centers via fedex so what they do is they put them in about 40 to 50 pound cardboard boxes that have a fire blanket integrated into it so i said you know what let's see how good the box does and i initiated a failure within the box and of course the blanket didn't stop the batteries from burning through the box completely. And that's 40 to 50 pounds of batteries in a box. And typically a pallet contains 20 of them. So think about a FedEx truck being involved in either a traffic collision or some sort of incident where the battery just fails in transport. And now you have 200 pounds of lithium batteries potentially in the truck that you have to contend with, uh, whether it be in a facility, in a structure, whatever it may be that you guys have in your jurisdiction. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that hit it, I think. <clears throat> um, the main causes of the EV fires that you've seen, what, what, what is the main cause or causes of most EV fires that you've seen so far? So the physical damage comes into play. We've had people, you know, uh, modifying the electric vehicles and they physically damage the actual pack in some way, shape or form. And then once that happens, they can't prevent the battery from going to thermal runaway. Um, a lot of them are just use related failure. So when we talked about earlier, the dendrite growth in a lithium battery, that's not something that necessarily has to happen because of obvious misuse. Um, it can be an age related failure where lithium starts to plate on one of the layers of the battery. And as a result, it can break down over time. So some of the conversations are you know, there's no lifespan necessarily right now for a lithium battery. Nobody says that you should be using a lithium battery if you ask the manufacturer for a thousand charge cycles. But um, the longer amount of time that takes place, there's the longer the potential for battery breakdowns to occur for various reasons. Um, but it, a lot of times, most of these situations that we're coming across, I feel like it's physical damage or physical abuse that's resulting in a failure. Obviously, uh, there was a lot of reporting in Florida recently where a lot of those electric vehicles were getting submerged in salt water and, sur and storm surge associated with the hurricane coming in. And a lot of those vehicles were experiencing failures because, you know, if you submerge a lithium battery in water, let alone salt water, which is even more conductive, you can create all those, you know, residuals on the connections and ultimately end up discharging batteries improperly and creating heat, which can put them into thermal runaway. Yeah. <clears throat> You had talked about some of the suppression methods, but I, I didn't hear you mention this, but FM200, yeah. like we use in data storage rooms. Do you know if that's been looked at or are they looking yeah, at Yeah, so, so a lot of people have tried using uh, you know, FM200 and other types of whether it's encapsulating or alternate extinguished suppression means, and none of them have been consistently successful in preventing the propagation or spread of a lithium battery fire. What, what you will see in a lot of those demonstrations, because I have a lot of people send me videos and ask, 
they extinguish the fire early enough with those products when it's one cell out of, let's say, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 involved. If you catch any of these fires early enough where the first cell is heating and venting and you stop it and you prevent it from propagating, it'll be just as effective no matter what extinguishing technique you use. But if any of the cells get big enough where they're propagating, putting the adjacent cells into thermal runaway, all of the available extinguishing means that are out there right now haven't necessarily been successful in preventing that propagation by either cooling it, breaking the chain reaction, um, or depriving it of oxygen. Because uh, one of the components that occurs when you have the electrolytes involved in these types of batteries, it generates an oxidizer as it breaks down. So you don't even need to be in an, uh, an oxygenated environment. So batteries can burn underwater. They can burn, the lithium batteries when they fail and are submerged in water can continue to thermally run away and burn underwater. We've seen that happen as well. Um, so a lot of people have been using the tactic of submerging electric vehicle fires, which sometimes works because you're trying to cool it as best you can. But uh, Tesla and other manufacturers don't recommend that just because you may actually be rapidly discharging the battery more so by submerging it in water, creating a more catastrophic event than you originally had with just the fire. So it's a developing uh, science, I guess we'll say. Yeah, I had a, I recently attended a conference and one of the private investigators said anytime they come across lithium ion batteries at one of their scenes, they take them and they bury them in the person's backyard. Yeah, so FDNY has kind of been at the forefront of developing post-fire mitigation strategies because, you know, they come across those e-bike situations or scooters on, in almost every fire they, they go to because it's the city, right? Nobody has a car, everybody has a little scooter. So the question is, okay, I have one battery that failed, but now I have five other batteries that didn't fail, but, but sat through a fire. What do we do? So they have been using their hazmat team and their response protocols to basically overpack the batteries and basically take them out of the structure. They, they remove them from the structure so that way they don't pose a risk to other occupants, occupants in the building or in the apartment or building of origin. Um, we, we, we wanted to evaluate in our last round of testing different quenching techniques. So we took a battery, partially failed it and put it in water. Uh, one of them actually took almost 24 hours for the battery to cool down. Uh, other techniques have been uh, sodium bicarbonate. UL talks about sodium bicarbonate at like a 20% mixture, I believe in water. So basically what you're doing is whatever cells are left in the battery, you put it in this mixture of water with salt or, so, or sodium bicarbonate, whatever it is, and it discharges the remaining cells so they can't go into thermal runaway and electrically fail anymore. You're just basically, you got a dead battery, a dead, dead battery. So that's an option. Uh, I've used at the FRL, because we do have instances when we put them in thermal runaway and they don't catastrophically fail, you have to then do something. So we use mineral oil because mineral oil is non-conductive. It's insulating and it kind of submerges the entire thing. And it, we put a FLIR on it, our thermal imaging camera and monitor it and it cools down you know, within half an hour and then it sits there and does nothing. And we consider it safe to dispose of at that point. Nice. <clears throat> If anybody else has any questions, you want to uh, put them in the chat. Mike, do you mind sharing your uh, question screen again that has your contact information in it so people can contact you directly? Yeah, um, and if anybody has any unique uh, situations that they come across, I'm always uh, interested in, in hearing them and I'll add them to the presentation. There's Every time I present this, I get more. Uh, there's there's several others that I can add that, that I may not necessarily have involved with. All of these, I had some sort of ancillary involvement in. Um, but if you have something unique that you, you're willing to share the circumstances about, please uh, feel free to to share that as well. I'll uh, share it right now. Yeah. Thanks. And also, Mike, uh, John McKenzie, who's on here, uh, posted there's a, a group that they've created that has about 1,200 people in it where they're sharing incidents of lithium ion battery failures. Uh, that's in the chat. Um, so if anyone here, um, it's a Facebook group called Lithium Ion Battery Fires. Yeah, somebody somebody shared that with me a while back. I'm actually a member of that, and they do post a lot of good information there. So it's definitely worthwhile for well, they people posted to check that we were going to put this presentation on. So it must be an all right group, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on top of uh, we can't see, you have a box. Um, you can move that box off to the side so we can. Oh, see. Oh, sorry. There you go. Let's see, is that yep, better? Yep. So that's Mike's contact information there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here. Um, but Mike, I just want to let you know, we really uh, appreciate you coming on and doing this for us. And uh, we started this two years ago uh, during COVID. It's, uh, it's been a fun project to work on. We thought we were kind of done with Andy Cox's uh, video, um, but we're going to just keep on doing it as long as we get, you know, really good instructors like yourself. But uh, one of the things that we do do, um, 
the Dakari were able to do this because of the Dane County uh, Fire Chiefs Association. Uh, they sponsor us and give us an annual budget to do these. Um, and obviously you work for the government and can't take any money. Uh, but we started this back with uh, Bob Toth, uh, the former president of the International. Um, but uh, we're, we've asked the instructors if we can uh, make a donation on their behalf. Uh, you and I have communicated and you chose the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Uh, so we made a $200 donation on your behalf uh, to that uh, charity. So we appreciate your time and uh, we appreciate every appreciate everybody attending. So thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, thanks a lot.